To listen to Business Movers one week early and ad-free, join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Download the Wondery app in your Apple or Google Play mobile app store today. It's October 19th, 1982 in Los Angeles, California. Automobile executive and engineer John Z. DeLorean steps off the elevator at the Sheraton Plaza La Reina Hotel. He makes his way down the hall to room 501. John's face doesn't betray the nerves he's feeling. He's gotten good at hiding what's going on in his head when he wants to. John knocks on the door and is ushered inside. John, thanks for coming. Always happy to make a trip to the West Coast. The other man is a banker who's helping John broker a multi-million dollar deal that will help save his failing business, the DeLorean Motor Company. At least that's what John thinks. In reality, the other man is undercover FBI agent Ben Tiza. And there's another person in the room too, a man John believes is a mobster entrenched in the burgeoning American drug trade. But he's actually a DEA agent. A bottle of champagne sits on a table nearby. John eyes it and laughs. Ah, you you got the bottle. Well, I told you we were going to celebrate once the deal goes through, John. Well, then let's get to it. I don't want it to get warm. They all take a seat. Even in a strange room with men he barely knows, John feels in control. Making deals has become second nature to John. Anyone watching would easily think he's the one running things. And he looks the part. At 57, John has finally started to embrace the natural color of his hair. Each white strand is perfectly coiffed, as if he's ready to appear on a magazine cover at a moment's notice. Now, John, before we consummate this thing, I want to make sure that we've all got our bases covered. You're good on your end. Like we discussed, the stock certificates are in a Eureka Federal Savings and Loan Trust account. And eventually, I see us being 50-50 partners. John is exchanging stocks for the promise of cash. He thinks he's pulled one over on the other men in the room. The stock certificates awaiting them are not for John's public automobile company. They're for a separate, private company. John has set up the private company to function as a shell corporation. It doesn't engage in any business operations, and it doesn't possess any assets. The stock John is offering in the deal is worthless. The way John sees things, he's going to get money for nothing. So, gentlemen, nothing has changed on my end since last we talked. I wouldn't have flown all the way out here if I wasn't ready to go. Well, hell, let's toast then. The banker pops the bottle of champagne and pours. John raises his glass. Here's to a lot of success for everybody. They clink glasses. The mobster moves to the closet and quickly returns with a large suitcase. It's stuffed full with tightly wrapped packages of cocaine, totaling about 55 pounds in all. Now, I know it might not look like it, John, but there's millions of dollars in that suitcase right now. John leans forward in his chair and picks up one of the packages. He laughs again. Oh, God, it's better than gold. Gold weighs more than that, for God's sake. John tosses the package of cocaine back into the suitcase. And before he even knows what's happening, several new men rush into the hotel suite. John DeLorean, I'm Jerry West with the FBI. John has been on camera from the second he arrived. FBI agents have been watching and listening to everything from the next room. One of the agents grabs John and cuffs him. I I don't understand. What's happening? You're under arrest for narcotic smuggling. By the next day, John DeLorean's picture would be splashed across the front pages of major newspapers all over the world. Almost overnight, he went from one of America's most high-profile businessmen to a cautionary tale about greed and corruption. John DeLorean's fall exposed the famous businessman for what he truly was, a criminal who engaged in financial fraud, political intrigue, and personal betrayal. From Wondery, I'm Lindsey Graham. And this is Business Movers. The 
The name DeLorean is synonymous with two major American innovations, the sports car and cocaine. The 1985 blockbuster hit Back to the Future made the DeLorean sports car a piece of cinematic history and a recognizable term in the American pop cultural lexicon. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Doc. Uh, Are you telling me that you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? The way I see it, if you're going to build a time machine into a car, why not do it with some style? But the name DeLorean is also associated with a major scandal involving shady backroom deals, government gainsmanship, and the 1980s drug trade. John DeLorean was an automobile legend. He was a gifted engineer and marketer who had dreams he wouldn't let die. His ambition catapulted him to the highest levels of General Motors, one of the most successful automobile companies in history. John's dreams, though, extended far beyond business. He changed the way he looked, dressed and acted in order to fit in with Hollywood superstars and young models. In interviews, he embellished his past and took credit for others' work. He became a major celebrity himself, but his public persona was largely built on a self-created myth of big success and big money. Some in the press likened John's fall to that of the Greek mythological figure Icarus, whose wings, held together by wax, melted when he flew too close to the sun. It was a fitting analogy for a man who spent years creating his own myth. But the improbable rise that preceded his fall began decades before John's arrest. It started back in the 1960s, when John caught a glimpse of the life he wanted in the City of Angels. This is the first episode of our four-part series on John DeLorean, The Prophet. It's 1967 at a party in Los Angeles. 15 years before John DeLorean's arrest. John stands alone, holding a glass of wine. Two years prior, in 1965, John's career took off. He went from auto engineer to head of General Motors' Pontiac division. And at 40, he was the youngest person in GM's history to lead one of its six major brands. And as he scored one success after another at Pontiac, John started leaving Detroit to spend more time in L.A., There was a different management and marketing style out west he said he was interested in. But in reality, he was attracted to the Hollywood lifestyle. Geez, John, did someone die? (laughs) What do you mean? I mean, I don't think I've ever seen anyone look so miserable at a party. John hasn't made a lot of friends in Los Angeles. But James T. Aubrey has taken John under his wing. Aubrey gained fame as something of a prophet in the television world in the early 60s. He seemed to have an uncanny knack for spotting the next big actor, knowing exactly what kind of shows the public would fall in love with. Uh, I don't know. I always feel a little awkward at these things, James. I'm not a big drinker. Uh, Neither am I, but I don't look like I'm attending a damn funeral. Aubrey is seven years older than John, confident in any room he walks into, and knows just about everybody in Hollywood. He's tall, obsessed with fitness, and effortlessly good-looking. He's known around town as the Silver Fox and has a reputation for attracting younger women to his side. John, you keep coming out here. You keep meeting people. They love your cars. They invite you to parties. You you don't have to act like a stranger when you're here. It's just, it's, it's still not my life. But you want it to be, right? And who wouldn't? Well, I can't do what you do. Why not? Why not, John? You're 6'4". You're successful. Hell, you introduced the muscle car to the world. It wasn't just me. That's not what I heard. I heard John DeLorean single-handedly saved Pontiac, gave America the GTO, and ushered in the age of the muscle car. John, you think the talking horse sold Mr. Ed? Um, what? It's not the talking horse that gets the network to greenlight a show like Mr. Ed. It's the guy who's pitching the talking horse that gets them to greenlight it. What does Mr. Ed have anything to do with anything? The product doesn't have to be the GTO or whatever other car you're pushing. The product is you, John. In the few years John has been coming to Los Angeles, he's embraced a style of advertising that people back at GM refer to as going Hollywood. It's the idea that attractive people, beautiful images, and great music sell products. The public doesn't care about what a car can actually do. They just want to imagine themselves having a great time in it. James Aubrey, in some ways, is urging John to do the same thing for himself. Oh, God. Where would I even start? John, you're a respected businessman. People think you're smart, and they think you have an eye on the future. That's a great starting place. So now, focus on the way you present yourself to the world. Your clothes, your weight, your hair, everything. 
Those old guys at GM are the past. You're what's next. So start acting like it. And once you do, the life you want out here won't seem so out of reach. Well, okay. All right. That's worth drinking, too. Cheers. When John DeLorean took over Pontiac in 1965, the division was struggling. Within a short time, John and his team turned things around. His bosses saw him as an innovator and a risk-taker. Many GM executives envisioned a bright future for John at their company. But as John's public profile grew, he embraced the lessons he learned from James T. Aubrey and others in Los Angeles. In 1967, John embarked on an image makeover. He started weight loss and strength training regimens. He completely changed the way he dressed and started dyeing his hair. Then, in 1968, John said he'd gotten into a minor car accident in California that would keep him away from GM's Detroit offices for a while. When he returned, his face had changed. He told colleagues his new look was a result of cuts and bruises from the crash, but John had gotten plastic surgery to give himself a more defined chin and jawline. The story of Pontiac's GTO also started to change. In 1964, the GTO had helped rescue the flailing Pontiac division, and it had signaled the coming popularity of the muscle car in American culture. While John had been a major part of the design and engineering team, it was very much a group effort. John wasn't even in charge of Pontiac at the time. But in 1968, John gave an interview to Newsweek, in which he pushed the idea that he single-handedly came up with the concept and the look for the GTO. He suggested that it was his deep understanding of youth culture that had led him to the idea. While other engineers and executives were stuck in the music of the 40s and 50s, John said he embraced rock and roll. He implied he could see the future in the music the kids listened to and in the way they talked. John's story of the GTO was that he knew the kind of car young people wanted even before they knew it themselves. This, along with the clear changes in his physical appearance, was where the myth of John DeLorean really took off. Magazines and newspapers all over the world wanted to talk to him about the GTO and where he thought the auto industry was headed next. They turned John into a celebrity and painted him as some kind of prophet. Soon, people in the press and public credited John as the man who essentially ushered in a new era of American sports cars. John never denied that version of events. In fact, he would capitalize on it for years to come. Then, in 1969, John overhauled his personal life to better reflect his new public image. He divorced his wife of 15 years, and before the papers were ever signed, John spotted a woman on the golf course and claimed he instantly fell in love. The woman was model and actress Kelly Harmon, the daughter of Michigan football legend Tommy Harmon and sister of actor Mark Harmon. When John and Kelly first started seeing each other, she was 19 years old. John was in his 40s. To the conservative leadership at GM, this was yet another example of John going Hollywood, and the GM executives weren't fans of the change. But it wasn't just John's public image and growing celebrity that started to ruffle feathers at GM. In 1969, John became the youngest person ever to be put in charge of GM's Chevrolet division, which was a much bigger job than heading up Pontiac. At Chevy, John embraced progressive practices and policies that would put more black employees in management positions, a move that rankled many older executives, who John felt were stuck in the past. He also argued that GM needed to produce cars more efficiently and be far more environmentally sound. John was determined to be an agent of change. In his mind, the executives at GM needed to get on board or get out of his way. But the executives at GM had other plans in mind. In 1972, after John had led Chevy for only three years, GM promoted him to the 14th floor. This was hallowed ground in the world of General Motors. The 14th floor was for top executives only. If you made it there, you had a real shot to run all of GM one day. On the surface, it was a huge promotion. But John quickly realized GM had moved him up in an attempt to rein him in. A few weeks after the promotion, John's immediate supervisor, Richard L. Terrell, summoned John to his office. John walked in, eager to talk about how things were going in his new position. Terrell didn't even let him start. He attacked John for acting like he was bigger than General Motors. Terrell said he was tired of seeing John on TV and hearing about him in the press. 
He told John that the 14th floor was a team, so he damn well better act like a team player. John left the meeting angry and frustrated. In his mind, Terrell had just told him to fall in line like a good little soldier, and John had no intention of doing that. There was no doubt John loved the spotlight, but he also believed it was up to leadership to question policy and promote innovation. If they didn't, nobody would, he thought. John's dream job was a nightmare. He now felt stifled and stuck at GM. His personal life was falling apart, too. His marriage to Kelly Harmon had hit a rough patch. John started leaving Kelly behind in Detroit while he took solo trips out to Los Angeles. Rumors swirled that John had returned to his Hollywood jet-set lifestyle and was already pursuing another young model named Christina Ferrari. The rumors were true. As 1973 approached, John's second marriage came to an end, and his time at GM was running out as well. Every three years since the 1930s, GM executives headed east for a weekend retreat at the Greenbrier Hotel in White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia. The retreat featured speeches from some of the biggest names within GM. It also featured rounds of golf and drinks at the bar. John was slated to give a speech at Greenbrier in March of 73. He took the speech seriously. This was his chance to say what was on his mind. John circulated a draft of the speech to everyone who needed to sign off on it. And in it, John didn't pull any punches. He accused the entire American auto industry of purposefully selling subpar products to consumers. American cars, he said, were built to break down. John also attacked General Motors directly. He claimed GM intentionally kept newer, cheaper, and more efficient technology out of their cars. John's bosses were not thrilled with the content of the speech. They asked him to tone it down before Greenbrier. John said he completely understood. He made changes and produced a version that everyone was happy with. On March 17, 1973, the day before GM executives would head to Greenbrier, a bombshell hit. The original draft of John's speech appeared in the press. This version of the speech not only attacked GM, it provided a number of company secrets that were never supposed to reach the public. GM hired a private investigator to find out who leaked the speech. The result of the investigation was clear. It was John DeLorean. GM reacted quickly. They told John his time at the company was over. They would allow him to resign and wouldn't accuse him publicly for the leaked speech, but he needed to pack up and move on. But if GM thought John would go quietly, they were sorely mistaken. John threatened to expose personal information about certain GM executives that could ruin their personal and professional lives. This was a tactic John would use throughout his career. He referred to it as getting a little shit on their shoes. John's threats worked. GM gave him a lucrative severance package and publicly claimed that John was leaving GM to spend more time on the social causes he cared so deeply about. When John walked away from GM in 1973, he was ready for a fresh start. He married model Christina Ferrari, and he put GM in his rearview mirror. He turned his focus to a dream that had been brewing in his mind for some time. After GM, John decided to strike out on his own, take on the giants of the auto industry, and mass produce the sports car of the future. Business Movers is sponsored by NetSuite. If you're a business owner, you don't need me to tell you that running a business is tough, but you might be making it harder on yourself than necessary. Don't let QuickBooks and spreadsheets slow you down anymore. It's time to upgrade to NetSuite. Stop paying for multiple systems that don't give you the information you need when you need it. Ditch the spreadsheets and all the old software you've outgrown. Now is the time to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle, the world's number one cloud business system. NetSuite gives you visibility and control over your financials, HR, inventory, e-commerce, and more. Everything you need, all in one place, instantaneously. Whether you're doing a million or hundreds of millions in revenue, save time and money with NetSuite. Join the over 24,000 companies using NetSuite right now. Let NetSuite show you how they'll benefit your business with a free product tour at netsuite.com slash movers. Schedule your free product tour right now at netsuite.com slash movers. That's netsuite.com slash movers. Business Movers is sponsored by ZipRecruiter. It went better than anyone expected. You make it look so easy, they said. Of course, it wasn't. It was a lot of long nights and lost sleep. But in a way, getting this thing launched was the easy part. The hard part comes next. Finding the right people to keep this train going. 
But hiring can be easy. Just head to ZipRecruiter.com slash movers. Because ZipRecruiter does the work for you. When you post a job on ZipRecruiter, it gets sent out to over 100 top job sites with one click. Then ZipRecruiter's matching technology finds people with the right skills and experience for your job and actively invites them to apply. You get qualified candidates fast. So while other services may overwhelm you with applications to sift through, ZipRecruiter finds you a qualified candidate. In fact, ZipRecruiter is so effective that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the first day. And right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash movers. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash movers. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. It's the summer of 1974, eight years before John DeLorean's arrest. John makes his way to a gate inside Miami International Airport. He stops at a payphone to make a call. Bill Collins. Bill, it's John. How the heck are you? Well, I'm good. I'm good. It's nice to hear from you. Bill Collins is a highly skilled engineer who has made his way through the GM ranks. John and Bill hit it off when they worked together at Pontiac. They've always shared a flair for design innovation and taking risks. Well, Bill, I have a flight to catch, so I, I want to get to the point. Don't take the job at American Motors. How do you know American is going to offer me a job? They called me to ask about you. Bill is still at GM, but American Motors is about to offer him more money and a better title. Was there something wrong with American, John? No, forget American, but get the hell out of GM. Come work for me. What? Bill, I'm real close to getting my company off the ground and building my dream car. The two-seater sports car? John pitched an idea for a two-seater back at Pontiac, but the company quashed it. Bill was a big fan of the idea, and he was always disappointed he and John weren't able to move forward with it. Yeah, but it's not just another two-seater, Bill. It's going to be the first ethical sports car, stainless steel. We're going to build it to actually last, not break down over time. Fuel efficient, too. All the new safety features. Better for consumers and the environment. And just so you don't think I've lost my sense of style, it's going to have gull-wing doors. Ah, like the old Mercedes 300 SL? That was a beautiful car. Yep, and we're going to mass produce it. Make it affordable for regular people. This is Ford rolling out the Model T, Bill. It's that revolutionary. Well, you're talking about starting an independent car company to go up against giants. Last time anybody was able to do that was Walter Chrysler back in 25. Well, that's just proof it can be done. I want you to head the whole engineering division, Bill. Ah, blank page? Even better. A blank page to make your own car. As long as it's stainless steel, it has gullwing doors, of course. Oh, it's very, very appealing. But I'd be leaving a sure thing at GM, John. Come on, throw off the golden handcuffs. Come work with me. Let me get some things in order, and I'll have to talk to my wife. But you'll hear from me real soon. When John was in college, he'd written a piece for the campus newspaper about the life of an engineer. It read, Being an engineer is to live in a mean, bare prison cell and regard yourself the sovereign of limitless space. It is to turn failure into success, mice into men, rags into riches, stone into buildings, steel into bridges. For each engineer has a magician in his soul. Bill Collins felt the same way about engineering, though he would put it in far simpler terms. When Bill was asked why he left GM to go work with John DeLorean, he would say, hell, I guess the concept of any engineer who loves cars is to be able to do your own. In September of 1974, Bill and John got to work at their offices in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. John had made sketches of his dream car, but nothing was to scale, and some of the images would be impossible to replicate in the real world. It was up to Bill to engineer a car that would meet John's ethical requirements, but still be roadworthy. They also needed a designer who could take Bill's plans and make it look beautiful. They headed off to the Turin Motor Show in Italy to find their man. There, John and Bill had a chance to meet with some of the most highly touted young Italian designers. Ultimately, they decided Giorgetto Giugiaro was the right fit. Giugiaro had worked on designs for Lamborghini, but he'd also worked with Volkswagen. This was a key combination for John. High-end Italian sports cars like Lamborghinis had the aesthetic John loved, but that company produced very few cars in a year. John wanted his car to have the sex appeal of a Lamborghini while still being mass-produced, 
and Jajara would be familiar with some of the constraints of mass production from his work at Volkswagen. There was also one more thing that John loved about the Italian designer. Jajaro had done work for Lotus, which was John's favorite sports car in the world. In October of 1975, John officially founded the DeLorean Motor Company. He had his chief engineer and designer in place, and now he had a brand he could pitch to investors. Of course, John was really selling himself, just like James T. Aubrey had told him to do. Along with cash, John needed land and workers to set up a factory to produce his car. John believed the bulk of the money he needed would come from government subsidies. He knew his company and factory would provide thousands of jobs, and governments would be willing to pay to make that happen within their borders. A group John was working with suggested he look into Puerto Rico. So John flew to San Juan and met with members of Fomento, the Puerto Rican Economic Development Administration. By the time John left, he was convinced he'd found a production home for his car. John was all in on Puerto Rico, but there was one major problem. In order to nail down a lucrative deal with the Puerto Rican government, John had to put in $25 million of his own money up front. John didn't have $25 million, not even close. So while the DeLorean Motor Company was up and running and Bill Collins was hard at work on a prototype for the DeLorean DMC-12, none of that would matter if John couldn't deliver. John headed back to Los Angeles and took meetings with some of the biggest names in Hollywood. Entertainment legends Johnny Carson and Sammy Davis Jr. jumped on board and became two of DeLorean's earliest investors. But even after tapping all his famous contacts, John was still a long way from $25 million. So he cast his net wider. John honed in on a wealthy Saudi investor who seemed eager for a chance to do business with an American celebrity. John touted his past successes at GM and sold himself as a man who could see the future of the auto industry before anyone else. He knew what the public wanted, John said. He'd done it before with the GTO, and he'll do it again with the DMC-12. By 1977, John thought he had a done deal with a Saudi investor and was confident the factory in Puerto Rico was a lock. But the investor wasn't willing to fork over millions of dollars solely based on John's sales pitch and public image. The investor arranged for a secret, in-depth investigation into the DeLorean Motor Company. The results of that investigation would prove to be prophetic. According to the report produced, industry insiders agreed that Bill Collins was an extremely talented engineer, but they expressed major doubts in John DeLorean's overall business plan. The insiders foresaw significant production delays, and they predicted John would not be able to maintain his ethical and safety-oriented design features if he wanted to sell the car at mass market prices. But perhaps the most damning information in the report was their assertion that the auto industry had passed John DeLorean by. They suggested that average drivers were no longer interested in two-seater sports cars like the DMC-12. A big part of John's myth was that he was a soothsayer, a man gifted enough to see the future of trends in the auto industry. But now, here was a report stating clearly that when it came to cars, John was stuck in the past. The Saudi investor walked away from the deal. John would have to find his money elsewhere, and he would have to do it fast. Luckily, John had an ally on Wall Street. Oppenheimer & Company, a major investment firm, had helped John raise money in the early days of his DeLorean venture. But he had only needed a few million dollars then. Now, he needed over 20 million. To get Oppenheimer and company on board, John did what he did best. He sold them on his vision and his ability to execute. He also sold them on his investment scheme, one of the largest limited partnership arrangements in the history of Wall Street at the time. John wanted Oppenheimer and company to help him put together a massive pool of investors who would benefit from big tax breaks and limited liability. Oppenheimer bought it, and the firm went to work on John's behalf. They attracted over 100 investors and quickly raised the money needed. But before John could close the deal with Puerto Rico, he was contacted by someone representing the Irish government. They wanted him to build his factory in their country, and Ireland's offer of government subsidies appealed to John, thinking he could get more money out of the Irish than the Puerto Ricans. In addition to that, setting up shop in Ireland might give the DeLorean DMC-12 the image of an exotic European sports car. He'd even be close to the headquarters of his favorite automobile, the English-made Lotus. John made a rash decision. 
he took the DeLorean Motor Company across the Atlantic to manufacture his cars in Ireland. If John had stayed focused on the present, things might have gone smoothly with the Irish. Instead, within months, he did something that torpedoed the entire deal. He talked about the future. He told the Irish government, the country that was planning to subsidize the bulk of his operation, that he had no intention of remaining in Ireland long term. People close to John said it was like he couldn't help himself. He just had to share his grand vision with Irish officials. Sitting in a meeting, John spun a tale that had the DeLorean Motor Company rising up and one day growing as large as General Motors. He was like David, he believed, come to slay Goliath. And he said that after his sports car hit the market, DMC would produce sedans, revolutionize the way buses were made in the United States, and continue to change and expand. By the end of the meeting, Irish officials reportedly sat stunned with their mouths hanging open. They had no intention of pouring tens of millions of government dollars into a company that planned on using their country as little more than a stepping stone along the way to bigger and better things in other countries. The Irish deal fell through, and John had angered the Puerto Ricans by taking his business elsewhere. So growing desperate, John talked of returning to the States to see if his connections back home could help him turn things around. An Irish lawyer changed John's mind. He told John to go to Belfast in Northern Ireland. That region, he said, was desperate for new business. Northern Ireland shares a landmass with the Republic of Ireland, but it's not part of the country. To this day, Northern Ireland remains part of Great Britain. But at the time, the region was mired in sectional strife. Starting in the 1960s, Belfast, Northern Ireland became home to a violent conflict known commonly as the Troubles. On one side were the loyalist Protestant paramilitary groups like the Ulster Freedom Fighters. These groups supported British rule in Northern Ireland. On the other side were Catholic paramilitary groups like the Irish Republican Army, the IRA. They wanted the British out of Northern Ireland and sought reunification with the Republic of Ireland, which would give birth to a new, unified Irish nation. As the violence between these sectarian groups grew, Northern Ireland spiraled into economic turmoil. The British government badly needed new business in the region to help curb the crushing unemployment rates and perhaps alleviate the tension between Catholics and Protestants. John knew that Northern Ireland was a dangerous place for him and his company, but time was running out, and John was desperate to get his fledgling car company off the ground. So he set up a meeting with British officials in Northern Ireland, hopped on a plane, and flew right into the middle of a war zone. Business Movers is sponsored by Talkspace. Mind over matter is a proven reality. The placebo effect, pain management, mindfulness. You can exert control over your body with your thoughts, but they have to be constructive thoughts, and sometimes those are hard to manage. Anxiety, mood shifts, anger, or depression can turn constructive thinking into destructive thinking. Talking to someone might help find peace and quiet within yourself. Talkspace is a network of licensed, experienced therapists specializing in depression, anxiety, substance abuse, relationship issues, and others. You connect online at a fraction of the cost of in-person therapy. And instead of waiting for an appointment, you can send unlimited messages to your therapist 24-7, and they'll engage with you daily, five days a week. Talkspace is secure and private, using bank-grade encryption and fully complying with HIPAA regulations. Get $100 off your first month with Talkspace. Match with a licensed therapist today. Go to Talkspace.com or download the app. Then use code MOVERS to get $100 off your first month and show your support for the show. Talkspace.com. Code Movers. It's the morning of June 18, 1978, in County Antrim, Northern Ireland, in the home of Catholic priest Father Hugh Murphy. It's a little over four years before John DeLorean's arrest. Father Murphy wakes with a start. The priest tries to get his bearings. He looks outside from his second-story bedroom window and sees a man pacing back and forth at the front door. The man calls out, Father, I'm in trouble. Help me, please, Father. Father Murphy rushes out of his room and heads downstairs, still in his pajamas. The banging on the door gets louder. Out of breath, Father Murphy makes it to his front door and throws it open. Two hooded men stand in front of him. 
Each man raises a gun and points it at the priest. Don't scream. Don't make a noise. If you stay calm and do what we say, we won't hurt you. I don't have much, but I can help you. This isn't about money. Now, if you go with us, you can help save a man's life. You wouldn't let a man die if you could prevent it, would you, Father? Father Murphy holds up his hands. The men grab his arms and pin them behind his back, still with their guns pointed at him. The two men then march Father Murphy to a car parked nearby. They throw him into the back seat and shove a coal sack over his head. They quickly tie his hands and feet. All right, go! The sounds of the city disappear as the car makes its way into the countryside. All right, here, here. The car parks near an abandoned barn. The men pull Father Murphy from the back seat and drag him inside. His hands and feet are still bound, and the coal sack is still over his head. Father Murphy is certain he's going to die. He prays silently. The men then force him out on the ground. I want to help you, but I don't understand how doing this to me is going to save someone's life. The Catholics ambushed two Protestant constables yesterday. They killed one on the spot and kidnapped the other. We're going to use you as ransom to get him released. Anything happens to him, you die. If he's returned, you live. The kidnappers are members of the Ulster Freedom Fighters, a Protestant paramilitary group. Gentlemen, I have spoken out against violence on both sides of the conflict. I do not support, in any way, what was done to those two officers. We know, Father. We've heard you on the radio and seen you on telly. That's why we chose you. The men disappear. Father Murphy sits alone, unable to move or see. He believes they will kill him regardless of what happens with the kidnapped police officer. He tries to make peace with it. Father Murphy has no idea how long he's been sitting alone. When the men come back in, pick him up and drag him back to the car, he assumes they're bringing him somewhere to shoot him. Where are you taking me? Home, Father. Did they return the constable? No. You can thank Reverend Paisley for your life. Protestant spiritual leader and politician Reverend Ian Paisley had made a public appeal to the kidnappers to return Father Murphy unharmed. Eventually, they gave in. Upon returning home, Father Murphy publicly called for the IRA to do the same for the kidnapped police officer, but it was too late. The constable's dead body would be found just a few hours later. John DeLorean and his team arrived in Belfast on the night of June 18, 1978, the day Father Murphy was kidnapped. The citizens of Belfast were still reeling from Father Murphy's seizure in the freshly discovered body of the dead police officer. Stories of the growing conflict, the troubles, dominated the news. Do you believe that there can be permanent peace in Ireland as long as Britain remains in the north? I honestly don't believe that there could be, because there will be in in future generations people who are prepared to take up arms. It is a lunatic but sad fact that but for the British army there would be civil war between Catholic and Protestant in this part of Britain. Hearing this news, John DeLorean feared the IRA's seeming escalation would make it nearly impossible to conduct business in the region. But he had no other options. Puerto Rico was off the table, and so was the Republic of Ireland. He had to give Belfast a chance. The growing conflict kept major corporations away from Northern Ireland, and investment of any kind dwindled in the region. Jobs disappeared, and people who could fled. The unemployment rate throughout the area continued to rise, and people struggled to survive. One report stated that in 1978, over 30% of Northern Irish families were living below needs level, and another 12% of families were on the borderline. At their meeting, British government and Northern Irish authorities made it clear to John that they desperately wanted his business in the region. They believed the DeLorean factory would offer over 2,500 new, well-paying jobs in the area and provide a significant boost to the local economy. But they told John there was more to it than just jobs. Protestants and Catholics would work in the factory side by side. If it was a success, maybe it could alleviate some of the growing violence between the two groups. John loved the business aspects of the deal. But the idea of bringing Protestants and Catholics together played right into his image as a champion of social causes. 
the Northern Irish offered space in the townland of Dunmurry, a section of land about five miles southwest of Belfast proper. Dunmurry had ample land for a factory and a large company compound. It was also close to Belfast Harbor, a major port for overseas shipping. This detail was crucial to John, as he still saw the United States as the market for his car. But John couldn't have cared less about the land and port if the British wouldn't invest. Their monetary offer didn't disappoint. The British government, through the Northern Ireland Secretary, ultimately offered DeLorean over $100 million in startup grants, with more subsidies to come. John couldn't say no. It would later be reported that he ended up putting only $390,000 of his own money into the entire venture. John's dream was coming into focus. His sports car of the future now had a home. Bill Collins and his team had produced a prototype that was already garnering interest from potential buyers and sports car enthusiasts. But Bill knew getting from the prototype phase to mass producing the DMC-12 would take a lot of work and a lot of time. As an engineer, John knew Bill was right, but as a businessman, John wanted to strike fast. It had now been five years since he left GM. He wanted to show people he was still the brilliant innovator and business mastermind they believed him to be. His cars needed to start rolling off the line as soon as possible. John DeLorean stunned Bill Collins and his entire team when he announced the DMC-12 would hit the American market in just 18 months. John didn't know it at the time, but his decision to build his factory in Northern Ireland and his call for rapid production of the DMC-12 would push him to the brink financially. But failure was never an option for John DeLorean. In order to save his company and the image he'd worked so hard to cultivate, John would do anything, even step outside the bounds of the law. It was 1978, four years before his arrest. But John DeLorean was now on a collision course with the FBI, the DEA, and one of the most wanted drug smugglers in the United States. On the next episode of Business Movers, as pressure grows in Northern Ireland to get the DMC-12 ready for mass production, John seeks out Colin Chapman, the man behind Lotus Cars. A partnership with Chapman leads John to turn against some of his closest friends and engage in a questionable financial deal that could bilk investors out of millions of dollars. From Wondery, this is episode one of The Myth of John DeLorean for Business Movers. If you like our show, please give us a five-star rating and leave a review. Be sure to tell your friends. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, The Wondery app, or wherever you're listening right now. To listen to the next episode right now, ad-free, join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. You'll also find some links and offers from our sponsors in the episode notes. Supporting them helps us keep offering our shows for free. Another way you can support the show is by filling out a small survey at wondery.com survey to tell us what topics we might cover next. You can also find me on Twitter. Follow me at Lindsay A. Graham. That's Lindsay with an A, middle initial A, two A's in Graham. And be sure to listen to my other podcast too, American History Tellers and American Scandal. A quick note about our dramatizations. In most cases, we can't know everything that happened, but all our dramatizations are based on historical research. If you'd like to learn more about John DeLorean, we recommend Dream Maker, The Rise and Fall of John DeLorean by Ivan Fallon and James Throats. My Years with John DeLorean by William Haddad. On a Clear Day, You Can See General Motors by Patrick J. Wright. DeLorean by John Z. DeLorean. And Framing John DeLorean, directed by Don Argett and Sheena M. Joyce. Business Movers is hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. Audio editing by Molly Bach. Sound design by Derek Barron. Music by Lindsey Graham. This episode is written and researched by Michael Federico. Edited by Leah Waters. Executive producers are Stephen Walters for Ritual Productions and Jenny Lauer Beckman and Marshall Louie for Wondering.